Uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's class, uh, being our inception class to uh, this unit, uh, labor law. And today uh, we're going to look at uh, introduction to labor law, and that is the topic that uh, shall take our time today. I hope that uh, you will enjoy your time uh, uh, during uh, this lesson. Now, my name is Enoko Tieno. I teach uh, labor law. Uh, and uh, uh, to begin the class, I, we just wanted to do an introduction on what really is uh, labor law. I, I know this is a terminology that uh, you've interacted with in one way or another. And uh, it's, it's not your first time uh, coming uh, or hearing this particular word, labor. I know in other, uh, other contexts it might m mean something else, but we're looking at labor in the context of work and labor in the context of uh, effort made uh, to accomplish a particular task. Now, they, <clears throat> there are various laws that touch on the rights of workers, the rights of employers, and the, basically the relationship that exists between uh, the, emplo uh, the employee and the employer at the workplace. Uh, over and above that, uh, this is also a type of law that seeks to regulate uh, the working environment for employees and also uh, creates uh, particular rights and obligations of parties uh, to particular uh, or parties in, a, in an employment uh, relationship or an employment contract. So we summed it up as a body of laws which address the legal rights of working people, uh, restrictions on them, and uh, their organization. You also say that you may also de uh, define it as, uh, as a body of law that mediates many aspects of the relationship that exists between trade unions, employees, and employers. You may also describe uh, labor law or employment law as a body of law that governs the employer-employee relationship including individual contracts, application of tort and contract doctrines, and large group of uh, statutory uh, regulation. I know that's a little bit complex uh, for, let's say, the lay persons to, to grasp. However, uh, in various other units that you have undertaken uh, in your legal studies, you might have come across the law of contract as well as uh, the law of torts. Now, there are various principles that are enunciated in those laws that touch on employment uh, relationships. For instance, if we talk about, say, the principle or the doctrine of vicarious liability on, uh, in the law of torts, in which employers at times, and when circumstances suit, they may be held liable for the actions of uh, their employees. And when we're talking about contracts, we know that for we to have an employment relationship there has to be an agreement between an employee and an employer to engage in that relationship. Therefore, at the very onset, there ought to be a contract between an employer and an, an employee. In that respect, therefore, the various, uh, the various elements uh, that underpin validity of contract, therefore, then plays a major role in determining uh, the terms of a particular employment uh, contract. So uh, basically that, and then, uh, so look, going forward, uh, if we to uh, proceed and look at what we'll be covering uh, in this unit, basically, being an introductory class, we'll be looking at the various uh, issues. Uh, to begin with, we'll be looking at matters employment, and other employment will be looking at the modalities for hiring and dismissal of em employees. We'll also be looking at uh, the training, basically, of employees. You know that there are certain uh, employment contracts that would require a, a particular individual to be trained in a particular way for them to be confirmed as employed. Or there are contracts that provide for probation periods. And uh, this basically gives the employer a leeway to determine the suitability of a particular person uh, to be employed in a particular uh, 
sector or in a particular for a particular uh, job then we'll also obviously look at advancement within that particular employment relationship besides that we also will be looking at issues wages of uh, uh, that are paid and this may come in terms of salaries to employees so we'll look at forms and methods of payment for instance the law abhors uh, payment in kind uh, as a consideration for working for a particular employer the pay rates basically the social security we know that we have the national social security fund act which requires that employers remit certain deductions to the national social uh, security uh, fund for uh, the em for the employee for them to benefit after uh, their after the termination of their employment relationship or upon uh, retirement then also basically by extension look at issues uh, pensions uh, then uh, we also look at the conditions of work how many hours should an individual work in a particular day uh, when should they start working and i, I uh, it's my assumption that this is something that you have an idea of uh, conventionally people work between 8 and 5 but now with evolving uh, global trends and also with the coronavirus pandemic working hours have con uh, continued to uh, to change uh, to take into consideration the effects and impact of uh, the pandemic we also look at under these conditions for work the rest periods obviously uh, every empl employee is entitled to leave uh, leave days in a given year or sometimes when they are not of good health they, they may apply to the employer to grant them time off uh, to enable them uh, recuperate uh, vacations issues child labor there are countries and uh, it's a global trend that employment of children is something that is uh, 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 is something that is frowned upon by various uh, laws in various kinds of jurisdiction then equal the issues of discrimination and equality at the workplace uh, some of the issues that we shall delve into when we're looking at the conditions of work and then uh, health and uh, safety these are key components of any employment uh, uh, relationship then uh, we also look at issues trade union labor and how what the role that they play the process for their registration how they engage employers or how employer organizations engage trade unions uh, to discuss issues that pertain particular uh, sectors or rather particular members or their members within those particular sectors of employment then we'll also look at labor management relations for instance now issues of collective bargaining again here come in handy uh, issues of enforcement of rights and, uh, and obligations in employment uh, relationships so rights and obligations of workers and employers organizations collective bargaining agreements and rules of setting strikes and other disputes are some of the issues that uh, we're going to discuss uh, going uh, forward then uh, um, we also wish to look at the classification of labor law generally there are broad categorizations of law and we would uh, want to borrow in that into this uh, unit and that is labor law is no exception to that broad categorization such that now we have two levels we have substantive and procedural and under substantive uh, substantive law as it is basically describes the rights of parties or rights of individuals and the obligation so it prescribes the standards to be observed with both employer and employee deals with contracts of service and contract for services uh, termination of employment uh, and basically the law that would be substantive in matters employment is the employment act uh, of 2007 so that is the primary legislation that we shall look at when looking at uh, we will we'll be discussing issues responsibilities and rights termination of employment among other issues cause because it is the substantive law on labor matters or on employment matters 
not to say that it's the only law. Uh, we've just noted that it is the substantive law. Then we have, uh, under procedural law, we have other uh, legislations, basically, that guide the process of enforcement of particular rights. So this pre uh, prescribes procedures to be followed in all labor matters. I see, for instance, the Labor Institutions Act, establishing various labor offices across the country, trying to address issues that pertain uh, the rights and the grievances of employees, as well as the employers at the workplace. We also have the Employment and Labor Relations Court Act, and this is uh, a creation of uh, under Article 162.2a, which creates a court uh, with similar status as that of the High Court, and these, there are two courts that are established under that particular article. We have the Employment and Labor Relations Court and the Environment and Land Court. However, we, that doesn't concern us. However, we will look at now the role Employment and Labor Relations Court uh, plays. So that uh, it requires then the, that any matter that involves labor or employment cannot be taken to any other court unless there is a Gazette notice that's prescribed so they have to be handled by the Employment and Labor Relations Court. Then we have the Labor Relations Act, now dealing with the issues of registration of trade unions, collective bargaining agreements, and all that. Then we have the Work Injury Benefits Act, dealing with the procedure for compensating employees who are injured at uh, the work uh, place. Then in our next subtopic, we're going to look at uh, sources of labor law. And uh, there is nothing really uh, different here. However, now when discussing sources of labor, labor law, we have to be very specific to labor law. We may use the general sources of law, which are relevant in this particular case, but for purposes of labor law, we'll then have to tell uh, how that particular source that you have uh, quoted is a source of labor law, or how that particular source provides for employment uh, matters. Now, to start with, we look at the Constitution of Kenya. We all know that uh, by Article 2 of the Constitution of Kenya, 2010, it is the supreme law of the land, and any other law that would be inconsistent with it uh, is automatically rendered null and void to the extent of that inconsistency. So under the Constitution of Kenya, we have Article 41, which is the primary article that talks about labor matters. And basically, it urges fair labor practices. And under Article 41, it grants certain inalienable, inalienable rights to the, both employers and employees, such that now no act of parliament can take that, those rights that are enshrined under Article 41 away notwithstanding the fact that even amending Article 41, which falls under the Bill of Rights, would require a national referendum to be undertaken. So that's how serious the Constitution is uh, pertaining matters uh, labor. Then we have a complementary article to Article 41, and which we may use uh, in this particular case, and that's Article 27. We know that issues discrimination at the workplace are commonplace, and Article 27 urges against discrimination on any ground, and it lists grounds upon which an individual would not be subjected to discrimination. And this may include race, tribe, uh, sex, uh, marital status, uh, among other issues. So we also have to look at uh, that uh, going forward. And I urge you, uh, to take your time and look at, study these particular articles and uh, use, uh, make use of the course outline and also consider the various cases that we shall be uh, highlighting uh, during uh, this uh, uh, unit. Now we have also Article 36, Freedom of Association. Remember, Article 41 provides that every employee has a right to form join and or participate in the affairs of 
a trade union. Therefore, there shall not be the right of uh, freedom of association shall not be taken away, and uh, the employee should not also be discriminated upon based on his desire or his action to form or to join or participate in the affairs of a particular trade union. Then Article 47 talks about fair administrative action, and it is the expectation of the law that when a disciplinary matter uh, proceeding is taken up, uh, against an employee, then the employee's right to fair hearing must then uh, be taken into account, and they have to be accorded that particular right. And Article 47 can be read together with uh, Article 50 where uh, necessary. Then we have Article 162 2A, which establishes the Employment and Labor Relations Court. And we had discussed that in our previous, uh, uh, in the previous slides on the role that the Employment and Labor Relations Court uh, plays in Kenya basically. So besides the constitution, then we have the various statutes and acts of parliament. Remember that acts of parliament borrow authority from the constitution of Kenya, and the constitution of Kenya borrows authority from the people who are declared under article one of the constitution as the sovereign, and that uh, that sovereignty is exercised through uh, elected mem members and uh, persons appointed to independent offices and uh, commissions. And by extension, statutes are enacted by parliament. The enactment is a result of a vote by representatives of the people. And after the bill has been passed in parliament, then it goes to the president for presidential assent. Remember that the president is also uh, a person that has been bestowed upon certain authorities by uh, the Constitution of Kenya and by the people of Kenya by, uh, by extension. Now, the Employment Act, as I would said earlier, is the primary legislation on matters employment in that it defines the various rights and obligations of parties to employment contracts and also it defines the various elements of any employment contract that an individual would try and rather enter into. So it contains legal provisions that relate to rights and duties of employers and employees, as well as containing general principles of employment, forced labor, discrimination, and sexual harassment at the workplace. It also provides for the basic conditions of employment uh, and also includes provisions relating to employment contracts. It also delves into issues of termination and when and under what circumstances an employment may be terminated. And we'll discuss that in our subsequent uh, lessons. Now, to continue this, we have the Employment and Labor Relations Court Act. Basically, it was enacted in 2011. It establishes the Employment and Labor Relations Court, or what others call ELRC. ELRC is given the exclusive original and appellate jurisdiction to hear and determine all disputes in accordance with Article 162. Now, we've talked about original and appellate. Now, there are circumstances where, and for the efficiency of that particular court, the Chief Justice is bestowed upon powers to delegate certain matters to the magistrate courts or any other court that uh, the Chief Justice may deem fit. Uh, and obviously, you know, while making this decision, this decision should, should go hand in hand with the role of the judiciary and the, sig uh, the, significant, uh, be, uh, the significant objective of the judiciary, that is to ensure that there is expeditious uh, disposal of cases and uh, ensure that justice dis is dispensed efficiently, effectively, and expeditiously. So borrowing that, it can then delegate that particular, uh, uh, delegate jurisdiction to other courts, which in this particular case 
uh, the magistrate courts. So that's the reason why the ELRC has appellate uh, jurisdiction. Now, when you are aggrieved by a decision of the environment and land, sorry, the, when you are aggrieved by the decision of the Employment and Labor Relations Court, you have a right of appeal uh, to the Court of Appeal. Remember that the ELRC has a similar status as that of the High Court, and therefore you cannot appeal decisions, such decisions at the High Court. You'll have to go to the Court of Appeal. The ELRC is also given the power to make orders in exercise of its jurisdiction. So it may determine uh, its jurisdiction on particular matters. So that means that they have been given a leeway to determine whether it has uh, the wherewithal to determine a particular matter uh, that has been uh, presented before it. Then we have the Labor Institutions Act, and this is the act uh, that was uh, incidentally enacted the same year the Employment Act was enacted, and that is 2007. So it establishes the various labor institutions, which include uh, the National Labor Board, and uh, which is charged with the responsibility of advising the Minister uh, for Labor and Social Services on matters, employment, and uh, labor. And basically, this helps in developing a national labor uh, policy. Uh, and then also, it establishes a, commi a committee of inquiry appointed by the minister to inquire into any matter connected with or relevant to trade disputes. Then we have the Labor Administration and Inspection that's basically doing things to do with the Occupational and Self uh, Safety and Health Act. It also establishes the Wage Council to advise the minister on remuneration and basically the basic uh, wage bill, or, or rather the basic wage uh, that uh, anyone uh, shouldn't go uh, below. So that's as appertains the Labor Institutions Act. Then we have the Labor Relations Act 2007. This uh, now brings in the issues of trade unions, prescribes the procedures for registration of trade unions, among others, and also the collective bargaining agreements. We also have the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which in most cases is abbreviated as OSHA, uh, read informally as OSHA. Uh, basically, this uh, legislation deals majorly on the safety of workers. Sometimes you may move into a construction site and you find somebody, everybody's wearing a helmet. They do not wear those helmets because the employers want. The law uh, seeks to secure the security and safety as well as health of various uh, practitioners and uh, or various workers. And even in the medical sector and with the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, you have had these discussions around protection of healthcare workers and uh, the requirement that every healthcare worker must adorn a personal uh, protective equipment or what they call PPE is. And you have a, must have a face mask, a mask, among other items for you to work uh, in hospitals. And this is basically for their protection. Unfortunately, we've had instances where we have lost workers or healthcare workers to coronavirus uh, pandemic. But the, what is expected is that they ought to be protected from such infection, uh, given the provisions of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Then besides uh, legislations, and I know there are other legislations that we may not have time to discuss now, but uh, we can just highlight them. For instance, we have the National Social Security Fund Act, and I addressed uh, what that is about. We have the National Hospital Insurance Fund Act. We have the uh, RBA, or Retirement Benefits Authority Act. We also have the Kenya Revenue Authority Act. Now, they are not they do not significantly delve into labor matters. However, they, are, uh, they have certain obligations that are placed on the various parties 
uh, with respect to deductions, uh, for instance, pay as you earn to the government, uh, deduction of the NHIF fund or money uh, forwarded to the NHIF. Uh, for the medical scheme, we have also the uh, NSSF, which now delves with the issues of uh, NSSF, which deals the issues of the pensions for employees and uh, working people. Then besides statutes, we have judicial precedents. Uh, basically, this is a case law. Uh, laws that are made out of sound judgments or uh, laws that are made out of lacuna in the law. Where the law is not clear on a particular matter, the judiciary or courts are expected then to bridge the gap. Uh, to ensure that whatever rights that have been infringed and those particular rights are given the impetus that uh, they deserve. And courts have taken advantage of this, rightly so, to make law and to, pro uh, to make pronouncements on issues, uh, labor matters. And we look at various cases uh, where that is so. Then we have also delegated legislations. Uh, basically, this borrows authority from various acts of parliament. I would want, do not want to delve much into that. We also have equitable principles, uh, the law of equity, basically. And with the time, we've seen a trend where various equitable principles are now being codified into uh, legislations. So besides that, we also have international uh, legal instruments we have treaties, conventions, uh, touching on uh, labor uh, matters. So we have conventions dealing with freedom of association, uh, collective bargaining agreements, forced labor, slavery, non-discrimination in employment, uh, child labor, right to organize and uh, collectively bargain, among other le international legal instruments. And remember when these international legal instruments are, when these international legal instruments are domesticated or rather ratified in Kenya, they become part of the Kenyan uh, uh, legal system or part of the Kenyan laws. Then uh, let us look at uh, the various uh, functions of labor law. What is the significance or the importance of labor law? Uh, is it just superfluous to have this law? Definitely not. So it has various salient uh, objectives to achieve and functions, and one of them is for the protection of employees. Labor in itself has a very, very uh, unfortunate history. Uh, coming all back uh, uh, from uh, the period in which we had slave trade and slavery, and there is a lot of resources that you can read about slave trade and slavery in Africa, Europe, Asia, and even the Americas. And uh, the presence of African-American community in the United States and across uh, various lands on this planet is uh, a result out of uh, slavery. So. With the time, there, there was the need uh, to protect employees from exploitation, uh, from uh, basically being used by people who had power at that particular time. So protection of employees, limiting the power of employers to dismiss employees at will, terminate their contracts without any just cause, regulating wages to be paid by maintaining financial capacity of employees, uh, for instance, currently even in Kenya we have the minimum wage, uh, which is 13,000 and, uh, and some hundreds, and that no employer ought to go below that. It should, no employer should pay the employee an amount that is isn't equivalent or less than that amount, and this uh, minimum wage continues to be uh, amended uh, as time and as conditions dictate. And I, I highly doubt that maybe next year we'll have an increment on the minimum wage bill, given the ravages of the coronavirus pandemic. Then we have regulating conditions for working uh, through providing for rest days and leave and hours of work, 
Uh, and I, th I think that is uh, self-explanatory under protection of employees. Then also it provides for care and welfare of employees. Then another function is balancing conflict of interest between employers and employees. And this is done by defining their rights and duties as well as regulating uh, their conduct. Uh, I think that also is self-explanatory. Then it also helps in resolving labor and industrial uh, disputes. Uh, that cannot be gainsaid. We also have looked at the role that the Employment and Labor Relations Court plays in the labor sector and basically in the resolution of disputes determining who has infringed what, who has uh, breached what contract or not. Yeah, and also it also helps in increasing production, production of goods and services, uh, and uh, production of goods and social services, and this is done by maintaining industrial uh, peace. Then we also have laying a correct balance of power between worker and their employers by protecting workers' rights to organize in trade unions and also to participate in collective bargaining agreements as well as strikes, setting uh, minimum labor standards, regulating the labor market, uh, uh, helps to avoid, for instance, non-discrimination. And these are some of the issues that we talked about when looking at the various sources of labor law. We also have uh, preventing conditions uh, from being, pre pre preventing working conditions from being pushed below the levels which the society deems acceptable by placing restrictions on contracting parties' freedom to contract on whatever terms. Remember, uh, as we'll discuss later in this class, there are certain formalities that have been laid bare as the bare minimum for any employment uh, contract, and that is prescribed by the Employment Act. So anything that goes against that, then the bare minimum conditions then set, uh, set in. So such that now an employee may not be held to uh, liable on the basis of such infringing terms as may be provided by their impugned uh, contracts. Then uh, in any employment relationship or uh, discussing matters labor law, uh, we must define who the employer is or who an employee is. And section two of the Employment Act six or rather attempts to define who an employer is and who an employee is. Not everybody or not every worker is an employee. So that's something that you ought to know, uh, you ought to have at the back of your mind. We have various types of workers, but not all of them are employees. And we'll discuss that as we continue. So in this particular class, we also want to look at the contracts of service versus contract for service. Now, in any setting, when a person is not an employee, definitely that person would be regarded as an independent contractor, somebody whose engagement is squarely on the purpose to accomplish a particular task for which a consideration has been assigned. So what is really the difference between a contract of service and a contract for service? A contract of service relates to employment relationship. In a relationship where we have employer and employee, then in a contract for service, we have independent contractors. And there are various tests that have come, that have been uh, deduced to try and help even courts determine who really an employee is. Because in certain cases, there are really overlaps where it's difficult to know whether somebody is an employer, uh, is an employee in a given setting or not. But remember, employers take advantage of such lacunas to render certain employees as independent contractors just to avoid uh, the legal implications, or rather um, avoid uh, <coughs> honoring the obligations in employment uh, contracts as provided under uh, the Employment Act. So that is, so a contract of service is an agreement between an employer and an employee. And while a contract for service is where an independent contractor is engaged for a fee to carry out a particular assignment or project, only employees are entitled to statutory 
rights of employees, meaning that the Employment Act does not, and I would want you to underline this, does not apply to independent contractors. The law that solely apply to independent contractors is the Law of Contract Act. However, there are disputes that end up in court and calling upon now the courts to determine whether somebody was actually an employee or, uh, or not. And we'll know more about that in our subsequent uh, classes. Now, there are various tests that have, been, that have come up. We have the control test. And to know whether somebody is an employee or not, one only needs to look at the nature of that relationship. Who has the power over the other? Who controls the other? For instance, who controls what is to be done? Who controls how that work is to be done? And who controls where that work is to be done? If all that... Uh, if all does lean towards the employer, then the courts have always pronounced such as employment uh, relationships. We also have, but however, the, in some cases, the control test is not as comprehensive and may not be applicable, especially in cases where we have skilled employees or skilled workers. For instance, a doctor employed in a, in a hospital. In such a case, the hospital may not have control on how that doctor works or what procedures that doctor ought to uh, prescribe for a particular patient that he is attending to. So that particular issue brought in now, uh, the difficulty that exhibited itself in solely applying the control test to determine whether somebody is an employee or not. Then we, uh, to try and address issues that came out of the control test, there was another test that was designed, and that is the integration stroke organization test. And uh, this particular test basically looks at the basic objectives of a particular business. And the question then that is asked is, the, then is uh, that is then asked, asked is whether that particular uh, objective whether the employee square, sorry, is part and parcel of that particular objective, whether their roles in that particular workplace plays a significant role in the achieving of the objectives of a particular organization. So in this case, for instance, the issue of doctors. A hospital cannot be a hospital without doctors nurses and other me medical practitioners and therefore to say that they were not employees and merely independent contractors is is absurd then uh, we also have another test and that is the mixed uh, or multi-factor uh, test which now urges uh, the usage of all these tests cumulatively and testing them in the process and whichever comes out uh, to lean towards a particular relationship, then that takes uh, the divide. Or they can also all be used uh, uh, together and summatively. And then lastly, we have the liability test. And I talked about, uh, I talked about uh, vicarious liability. And basically, this helps in determining who is liable. This squarely comes out uh, the dispute of whether somebody is an employee or an independent contractor usually comes out twofold. One, when somebody, a third party has sued the employer and now the employer seeks to disown the employee, then the issues of determining whether somebody is an employee or not then would uh, set foot. Or where the employee is aggrieved by the termination of their contract uh, by the employer and therefore they petition the court to uh, protect their rights. Again, that issue may as well ar arise. So uh, lastly, I uh, want to look at contents of a contract, a contract of employment. And remember I earlier on stated that there are bare minimum conditions 
or terms of any employment contract. If any employment contract goes against any of those bare minimum conditions set out in the Employment Act, then uh, the Employment Act, those terms are set out in the various sections of the Employment Act set foot, meaning uh, uh, nullifying such infringing uh, terms. So uh, an Employment Act must prescribe the name, age, permanent address, and sex of the employee. However, the issue of sex is now nowadays optional because we also have the LGBT uh, community and that uh, you shouldn't be forced actually to dis dis disclose your, your sex if you do not want to. However, in Kenya, we know that's not what happens. It's either you want the job or you want to protect your uh, sexual uh, rather orientation or your sex. Name of the employer must also be prescribed. Job description of the employment must also be described. What type of work? What is your role? What is your designation, basically? The date of commencement of employment must be prescribed because that is important. There are people who are mischievous and, and employers who do that. Uh, uh, and we look at various categories of workers as we proceed. Then we have the form and duration of the contract. If you are employed on contract basis, then the duration must also be stated. If you are employed on permanent and pensionable basis, then that must also be prescribed. The place of work must also be described. But things are now evolving. People are working from home due to the coronavirus pandemic. Hours of work, again, there is flexibility. However, statutory, people are expected to work between 8 and 5 uh, p.m. And any work that is uh, beyond that then should be considered overtime. Then we have the remuneration, which is a very uh, crucial component of any employment contract. Uh, it must prescribe the consideration, the pay, the salary, the wage for which uh, that work is done. Then the intervals at which remuneration is paid. Again here, are you paid on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis or on a quarterly basis? All that must be determined. Uh, and there are also other additional terms that we'll engage and interact with as we continue uh, our lessons. Now, that marks the end of uh, today's class. Uh, I hope uh, that you enjoyed uh, your time. Uh, and I want to appreciate you for staying with us uh, through the class. And uh, until we meet next, say bye for now. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.